السلام عليك زين الأنبياء السلام الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد مفتاح باب رحمة الله عدد ما في علم الله صلاة وسلام دائمين بدوام الملك الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه وشر أنه الله الذي لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له إلها واحدا ورب شاهدا ونحن له مسلمون وشر أن سيدنا وحبيبنا وكرة عيوننا محمد عبده ورسوله أرسله الله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهر على دين كله ولو كره المشركون أما بعد يا عباد الله إني مصيكم ونفسي يا يبتك الله. The greatest thing that we can remind ourselves of on a weekly basis is to be people of taqwa. Is to be people who are aware of the Lord Subhanahu wa Taala in every moment of their life, not only when they are beyond the eyes of people, but also. That when they when they're with people, when they're not with people, when they're alone or when they're in public, is that our Prophet reminded us, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and in fact commanded us, it taqwa haytha ma kunt, that have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa taala wherever you might be, and as these scholars always reminded us, is that we should always strive to be where Allah taala wants us to be, and never to have Him see us. Where he has forbidden us from being, Subhanahu wa Taala, the seven ways in which that we sin are with the seven limbs, and if you can add to that the heart, then we have eight ways that we can then sin. Each limb has a number of sins that it commits. That when you start to learn about those sins, that you will learn then how to have taqwa in relation to that particular body part. Today we want to look at. One of the famous hadith of our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and we want to approach this not as even the one speaking is something that we have definitively attained, but as something that we agree this is a goal that we need to strive towards. And the concept or the topic rather of character is something that every single one of us. Should be thinking about on a daily basis and striving to improve, just as that we upgrade our phones, just as that we buy that cars that are better, just as that we upgrade our homes, just as we do all of these things in relation to our worldly life. The most important thing that we need to upgrade is our character, and this is a principle that we have to take very seriously. And the Arifin Billah. The ulama al-aminin, they are very hesitant to have any progress outwardly that doesn't simultaneously lead to true progress, which is spiritual progress. And we live in a civilization and in a time where there is an obsession with this hollow plastic word that we call progress, that we don't really know what that means, but it is something that people have that dedicated their lives to. And that end up being a cog in the wheel for something that, in the end, is not going to make them happy. True progress is progress of the soul, is moving up in the degrees of the soul, whether you classify them as three or whether you classify them as seven. Moving up in degrees of the soul, in purity of the soul, and in particular, in so far as it relates to character, and this is something that we know, but we have to remind ourselves time and time again. And there is a hadith of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم that teaches us the importance of character, and really establish it as the criterion for someone's religion, as opposed to knowledge or worship. And in this narration, we know that there was a lady that who used to pray at night and fast during the day. And our Prophet was informed about this lady, and as if people were that impressed with her and what she used to do. But then he was told, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, is that she used to hurt her neighbors with her tongue and speak ill of them and lash out at them. And then what did our Prophet say? La khaira fiha. He negated all good from her. 
Not that, okay, she's a good person, but she needs to work on this. La khaira fiha. There is no good in her. He is from the nar. She is from the people of the fire. Nasallallahu salamu wa afiyah. And that we have to come to terms that there is Jannah and there is Nahr. This is a reality. And if we try to wiggle around trying to deal with ultimate reality, ultimate reality will strike whether we like it or not. And we won't find ourselves prepared. Muslims are, to borrow this ever so problematic Western term, realists, if you will. In other words, is that we are people that strive to come to terms with reality. And this is one of the most difficult things of all for the human being is to come to terms with reality. And so character is that defining point in someone's religion. That if you want to know who is truly religious and who isn't, is that we have to look at their character. And that the word in Arabic for character is khuluq. And it is closely related to another word that indicates our physical body, which is the khalq. And so that when we talk about the shamal of the Prophet and we study his khalq and his khuluq, his physical characteristics, just as we study his, the internal characteristics sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it is as if, just as your khalq is it has been imprinted in you in that sense is that there's very little that you can do to change it. Yes, that you can go out in the sun and maybe get a tan. Yes, you can exercise and become a little bit stronger eventually that you, as you grow up, you will grow taller and so forth. But there's very little that you can do to actually change the way that you look physically. And in fact, that we know that this is from the work of shaitan, is that he wants to see you disfigured. And he wants to see you in a way that he wants to encourage the human being to change the way that they physically look. And this is why that there is a hadith of our Prophet Wasallam that indicates is that when you yawn, that place your hand over your mouth, wala ya'wi, and do not that howl the way that a dog would howl. The Prophet is giving us a comparison here to the sound that people make without making it uh, when they yawn. And our Prophet taught us to cover our mouth and preferably with the left hand, and scholars differ is it with the inside of the left hand or the outside of the left hand. Nevertheless, that he taught us this Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then he says that because shaitan will enter into your mouth that if you do not cover it. And we have to understand how shaitan works. And we already know that he circulates in the human being like blood. Yajri fi ibn Adam majra dam. The way that blood circulates, in other words, is that blood is inside of us and it is providing that life for us. Shaitan has access to us in ways that we don't fully understand. And that we know in general that he sees us and we do not see him and he can whisper that insinuations into our hearts whereby then if we put them into practice and actually believe and follow them, it will get us in trouble with our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so that one of the commentaries that on this hadith, and this is the reason we went into this detail, that states is that when someone that yawns that excessively, is that shaitan likes to see the human being disfigured. And this is why that all of these pictures that we have on the iPhones and iPads where you can actually change the way that you look and have disfigured, we really shouldn't let our kids do that. That's not right. We should not let our kids use that function on the phone to have a disfigured, ugly image of the human being. That is something demonic because that's what shaitan wants to do. And that the whole idea of disfiguring the body, the body is that sacred and sanctified. And it is not something, we are not at war with the body and all of the meanings that pertain to a, the post-Christian religion of Islam but also in relation to the demonic tendencies of the modern world and wanting to change so many aspects of our body. Whether we are unhappy with the way that we look and we want to look more beautiful or that leading to extremes where we might want to even change our gender or something of that nature. This is all that demonic in nature. So we wanted to focus briefly today that on this hadith of our Prophet that is mentioned in the collection of Al-Bukhari which simply states, 
the best of you are the best in character. The best of you are the best in character. And so we first have to be convinced that that's true. Well, this is a statement of our Prophet ﷺ. How could it be anything other than the true? He would only spoke the truth ﷺ. But we have to make that our criterion on how we observe out in our relation to our interaction with other people. Not that we judge other people, but we have to be very careful if someone that is very worshipful or that they have a lot of knowledge but we notice flaws in their character. It doesn't mean that you can't benefit from them. It just means that person still has that growth that he needs or she needs to that acquire. And so this is a standard that we can place before ourselves. Good character is something that we recognize is the most important defining characteristic of the true nature of our deen and then hold ourselves to it. And if we fall short of it, what do we do? We make tawbah. We repent to Allah Ta'ala. And we don't justify our wrong. How many stubborn people do we know that when they're wrong, they will try to justify their wrong. Whereas they should just admit that they're wrong. And we are all imperfect. There's no doubt about that. That we will all make mistakes. There's no doubt about that. We will fall short maybe even after the khutbah. That in relation to these things. But we have to at least agree to what was just mentioned and secondly do our best to take ourselves to task day in and day out and hold ourselves to this standard and if we die falling short penitent turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the hope is is that he will bestow his mercy upon us tabaraka wa ta'ala so in the commentary on this hadith the great Imam al-Munawi that he said he quotes one of the scholars by the name of Yusuf ibn Asbat, who says, Alamatu husn al asharatu asha. And that we will briefly go through them. The sign of good character is ten. Ten things, literally. The first is qillat al khilaf. Rarely engaging in arguments. It is not considered to be a religious thing to do to engage in arguments whether they are for the religion, let alone for things of a worldly nature. Be having an argumentative personality is not a good thing. And there are some people that are like that in their religion, but not in their worldly life. Or they're like that in their worldly life, but they're not like that in religion. In both spheres, is that yes, that if we have a debate where people really want to come together, then they can apply the sign that they're true in their debate that we mentioned last week in relation to Imam Shafi is that you actually want the truth to come on the one that you are on the tongue of the one that you are debating. But that it's not a good thing to be argumentative. And if we find ourselves constantly getting ourselves in arguments, that we need to stop and think, why is this happening? And we need to question about something in our own nature and be introspective. Secondly, Treating people fairly, what's known as husn insaf. Insaf is one of these words that is similar in meaning to qist, it's similar in meaning to adal, it roughly refers to fair treatment. Treating people fairly, that not discriminating against people. And you'd be surprised that how much discrimination is in our Muslim community. All you have to do is speak to converts from certain backgrounds and ask them. And you would be actually amazed at how that our community discriminates against the other Muslims that are in the community. And this is just uncalled for and simply has to stop. Is that we have to appreciate our diversity. We have to appreciate different cultural and ethnic backgrounds. And we should see those differences as being a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it enriches us is that all you have to do is open your mind to understand and see the beauty that is in many of the cultures that worldwide and notice the beauty and focus on the beauty but discrimination is part of it but also that establishing justice is that if someone comes to you and complains about someone else you can't just take the word of that person you got to get both sides of the story how many problems do we have and really it stems down to a lack of leadership that if someone comes to you and complains about someone is that 
it is not fair for you to make a judgment unless you hear the other person's perspective first. And almost always that you will find, as it says it takes two people to tango, is that both people had some part to do. Now who's more at fault? You have to look carefully to see. But nevertheless you have to be able to be in a position where you hear both people out and then make a fair judgment. And sometimes it's better to not get involved if you feel is that the people will put into question what you decide regardless. And it might be better just to avoid it. And that's from the dictates of wisdom. But being fair in our interactions with others, and this also relates to giving people their rights, is that this is a bare minimum. We should strive for ihsan. And if we are people of Ihsan and we are a community of Ihsan and we have interactions of Ihsan, that is excellence, is that you're not in need of that asking or demanding your rights. Asking for or demanding your rights. And there's amazing stories that we hear, again, not to create this utopian type of ideal, however, there are stories where you actually have cities at particular junctures in, Mus in Muslim history. And I've heard this story from my teachers where the, the Qadis that were getting paid for a full-time position but rarely would anyone ever come to them. There was almost no need for lawyers, Qadis, to judge between people. Because if you're people of Ihsan is that you will very easily be able to settle your disputes amongst yourselves. And in general is that the more the person who goes low is the closest to Allah and will receive the most reward. So rarely engaging in arguments in treating people fairly. Three, not seeking out people's faults or their mistakes. In Arabic, Turk talab al-atharat. Athara ya'thuru literally is to slip up. So people are walking and they slip right on the path. And just as that person didn't intend to do that, but it, he wasn't paying attention, or that there was something in the road. Is that likewise, on the spiritual road, there's all kinds of mistakes that we make. And some of them, and many of them in fact, are unintentional. And it's not considered to be a noble thing to focus on someone's faults, or their mistakes especially. Because we all know that we make mistakes, and the amazing thing is, is that when you reprimand people for mistakes, you will find oftentimes you fall into a mistake shortly after that. If you pay close attention to the way that things work, is that you rebuke someone for something or criticize them for something or follow a, point out one of their mistakes and then you find yourself, wow, shortly after that, that you fell into the same thing. To remind you, is that kama tadin to that, right? That the way that you, that this is one version of the golden principle. The way that you want to be treated, you should treat others. And that in its most important sense is that the more mercy that you show and tolerance with other people, the more mercy you will be shown by our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when people stumble, we expect that they're going to stumble. Is that we don't that point out their faults. We don't seek out their faults. Rather, we do our best to try to cover them. Four, thinking best of what appears from people's mistakes. Now the Arabic ibara here states, Tahseen ma yabdu min sayyat. And so sayyat literally are sins, that wrongs that people do, and that sometimes they become apparent to people. So in the first the, the previous one that was mentioned, it's you don't seek out their faults. That here this is saying is that when people's faults appear, that tahseen, and this could roughly be looked at in two different ways. One is thinking the best of people, that when that happens, giving them the benefit of the doubt. If there's no excuse that you can make for them, is that then tahsin here could mean is that you find ways to veil them. Because the nature that when someone has a trait that is not a good thing becomes public and then people start to see it in them and notices that they have it is that they start to lose their hayat, 
in their modesty before their Lord and shame, if you can translate it with that problematic word shame or that misunderstood word shame. And what ends up happening is if it leads to a guilt, some people's response says, well, I'm going to do it anyway. So it's a good thing to try to cover up to the extent possible. And now we're not talking about that rights that people have in oppression and things like that. We're talking about things that aren't affecting other people, but things that people do wrong to cover them up, to have a good opinion or to cover them up into that try to veil our Muslim brothers and sisters when we speak about them to other people. And then number five, iltimasid adar. And this could be translated as seeking people's forgiveness. And that if someone comes to apologize to you for something, to not accept their apology is a very serious thing. There's a hadith that directly speaks about this. It is a very serious thing if someone comes to apologize and you're not required to know whether they're sincere in their apology or not. Is that you take it at face value. You accept your, their apology. And that you should simultaneously that forgive people when they come to seek your forgiveness, but also to seek other people's forgiveness. Is that we, if we're wrong, we have to have the courage to say that we're wrong and to seek people's forgiveness. And the beautiful thing is, is that wounds can heal. Look at the resilience in the human body. There's this incredible book called Super Survivors. Well, it's about these people that went through these unbelievably difficult tribulations and not only did they heal from them, is that they use those immense tribulations to change their lives, to dedicate themselves to helping others that go through similar tribulations. Super survivors. And I would never use that word to describe the prophets and messengers, but the prophets and messengers and the elect of the Oya and Sani, that's how they are. Is that the immense tribulations that they go through only that brings out the best that's in them and positions them to be able to then help other people who are also going through those same things. Our Lord did not promise us a tribulation free life. But he did promise us that if we turn to him, he will soothe our pain and give us the ability to bear it. But we have to choose the way that we're going to respond. And so that seeking people's forgiveness is the fifth sign of good character. Six, ihtimal al ala mm. Bearing harm from others. Ihtimal al ala The nature of the human being Someone says something to you, rawr, say something back, right? Someone hits you, bah, you hit them back, right? They do that to me, well, I'm going to do that back to them. Character is what? Ihtimal, bearing harm from others. And you'd be surprised, ask Sidi Abdul Rahman about his experience. You think that the shuyukh are always in a state where that every, everything's rosy, Go back to the Muslim world and see that the real story. Ask him about Sheikh Abdullah al-Haddad and the way people treat him and the things that happen to unbelievable things happen. You would be surprised. Is that yes, people oftentimes show deference to people of knowledge and so forth, but there's a lot of stuff that they also have to put up with. And you'd be surprised what happens behind the scenes. And beyond even the knowledgeable person or the scholar, is that all human beings learning to bear harm for others. Now, if you understand this in a Western context, it would sound weird to like a psychologist or a psychiatrist. What do you mean? Bearing harm. Obviously, there's limits. It doesn't mean, and people automatically think, oh, Muslim women are oppressed, so that means that they just have to bear their... That's not what we're talking about here that forget these false frames and leave them aside. In general, this principle is true wherever that harm is coming from. To learn to bear harm is a noble thing that indicates someone has good character. And that part of bearing that harm means is that you don't lash back with something similar, is that you learn to restrain yourself. And that 
bearing on behalf of other people their tribulations and bearing the harm that comes their, your, their, their way that from other people is one of the greatest that prerequisites of wilaya, of sainthood. And then, that, and there was a, another story about that just real quickly. Well, we'll move on for time. That number seven, that reproaching oneself for shortcomings. Is that this is the foundation of the spiritual path. Is never being content with yourself. Always knowing that you can improve. Is that being introspective. That understanding that you need to work day in and day out to refine yourself. And not just that, malama, reproaching yourself. And one of the ways is that you can that better your interactions with all people is as mentioned in the Hayalu Medin of Imam Ghazali, one of them said, is that no one is ever able to rebuke me, reproach me, or humiliate me the way that I already rebuke, reproach, and humiliate my own self. Is that you put yourself in check and you reproach yourself and you're hard on yourself and you upbraid yourself and yes, that there's even times that you might pose that punishments on yourself. That things that you know that you should have done that you neglected. And as a result is that I'm going to give out wealth because of that. Or I'm going to do this because of that. Is that this is the source that of our spiritual development but also community healing. It can't happen without this. And then that's closely related to seven, focusing on one's own faults. Notice the word here is focusing. It doesn't mean that you don't advise other people because you do. Especially with your children that you're supposed to rear them and teach them that virtue, there's no doubt about that. And if there's some advice that you can give to someone in the community that implicitly that's better than explicitly, but it, fo the focus is on your own self. And where every person to focus on their own self is that you would all of a sudden find that there is an effect that it has on everyone present. And then number nine, having a cheerful presence. Literally, it says talaqatul wajh, which indicates that we should smile. And we've spoken about this before. I mean, we'll repeat this time and time again, but it's not just about the smile. It's about having a cheerful presence. Is that we should be a source of upliftment. When people are around us, they should feel good. They should be happy, is that we should that help people move from their state of anxiety to a state that is better, to a state where they are starting to experience the beauty of what it's like to have a serene and tranquil heart. And then finally, husn al-kalam, speaking well. And this means that we avoid using bad language, which is obvious. But this also means is that we speak to people in a way that is not dishonoring to them, is that we speak to them in a way that we recognize the blessings that Allah Ta'ala has given, calling them by beautiful names. It also means is that we use euphemisms for words that we shouldn't really be speaking of. And to the extent that Sayyidina, that the, that, uh, that Sayyidina Umar bin Abdul Aziz, the sixth caliph, he used to use the word underarm for that which was beneath the arm because he didn't want to use the word in Arabic for that, a euphemism, and let alone other body parts, let alone other types of acts or things, using, speaking well. And that in all of its different applications, in terms of the respect of people, in terms of what it is that we talk about, this is one of the great signs of that good character. And so that we need to strive towards these. There's no better time to do this than in the beginning of the year of 1438 of the Hijrah of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. May Allah Ta'ala give us tawfiq in doing this and bless us all to be able to live up to the standard, at least the bare minimum of these great traits that are great, are signs for good character.
الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين والصحابة الأكرم وتابعينهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وعلينا معهم وفيهم برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمد رسول الله أما بعد يا عباد الله إني مسيكم ونفسي يا يبتك الله اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد مفتاح باب رحمة الله our Prophet وسلم, is the door that opens up the mercy of Allah. In other words, that if you want to experience the mercy of Allah, this overarching word, the manifestations of which are unlimited in the way that we experience that, is that it requires that we both have a love and connection to our Prophet وسلم, and mention him often. In salawat, our Lord in the Quran subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to do many things. When it comes to salawat upon his Habib sallallahu alayhi wa he begins. Inna Allah wa malaikatuhu yusalluna ala al-Nabi Ya ayyuhu al-ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima Allahumma salli wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala ala Sayyidina Muhammad Kama sallayta ala Sayyidina Ibrahim wa ala ala Sayyidina Ibrahim Wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala ala Sayyidina Muhammad Kama barakta ala Sayyidina Ibrahim wa ala ala Sayyidina Ibrahim Fi al-alamin inna ka hamidun majeer wa radiyallahu ta'ala an saadatan khulafa al-rashidin Abi Baka wa Amma wa Uthman wa Ali wa ala jimi ahli bayi بيت رسول الله المطهرين من أرجاس وعلينا معهم وفيهم برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات المسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم والأموات we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us to have good character, to fill our hearts with the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the love of His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May we have a close, intimate connection with our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a connection whereby which all of the virtues of goodness is that they flow into our heart, Ya Rabbit Alameen. And not only do they flow into the heart, but they all become a reality within us. And once they become imprinted in us, that they never ever leave us until the day we die, Ya Rabbit Rahmeen. Allahum, we ask you to bless us to be able to see truth as truth is. And we we ask you about us to be able to follow it. And we ask you to be able to avoid all falsehood and be able to see falsehood as falsehood is. And rest us to refrain from falling into it. Ya Rahman Rahimin. We ask you, Ya Allah, to always move closer to you in all of every day of our life. Ya Rahman Rahimin. May we constantly be in an increase of knowledge and an increase of worship. We ask you, Ya Allah, in this time of fitna to protect us and to protect our hearts and to protect our minds and most importantly protect our children. Ya Rabbi Alameen. Our innocent children that are growing up in this mess and chaos of a society in which we live. Allahumma. Make them firm upon the path and ward away off of them all difficulties and tribulations anything that will take them astray Allahumma give us tawfiq in all of our different affairs and bring healing to the Ummah of Sayyidina Muhammad and bring relief to the Ummah of Sayyidina Muhammad and to remove the calamities that are afflicting the Ummah of Sayyidina Muhammad Awakum Allah Nasurakum Allah and Allah Ya'mur Bada Adil Wa Ihsani Wa Ita'id Al-Qurba Wa Yanha'an Al-Fahshai Wa Al-Munki Wa Al-Baghi Ya'idukum La'allukum Tadakkaroon Udhkuru Al-Radhim Yadkurkum Wa Shkuru Al-Ni'mi Yazid وَلَا ذِكْرُ اللَّهِ أَكْبَرُ